I'm a full stack developer at monday.com on the autopilot team. And today we're here to talk about async hooks and how to use them and my journey to create persistent execution context. And if we're already putting a bunch of words together, then why not add a few more words? And since we're all Node developers and we're talking about web servers and lots of requests, let's talk about a journey to a realm with persistent request level execution context. So now that I've taken all those big words and put them together, let's break down what we're actually here to talk about. So starting from the, the bottom, execution context is something a lot of us are familiar with from previous frameworks or languages that we've worked in. Maybe we call it thread local storage or thread session, session context, various different words, but it all boils down to the same thing. We want to have certain information in hand, and it's what our code has access to when it's being evaluated, when it's being run. Request level execution context. So as I said, we're talking about web servers. We get lots of requests. And when we have that execution context and we have the information that we want to access, we want it to pertain to a specific request. We want to know that the request we're currently handling is the same information that we're going to have access to. Persistent request level execution context. So persistent just means that it's really going to be accessible to us regardless of where we are in the flow of our code. I looked up persistent to have something uh, clever to say about it in this talk. Didn't really find anything interesting except for that tenacious is a synonym. I think that tenacious uh, has an undertone of kind of overcoming hardship or being very dependable. So I thought that was appropriate. It's also a very cool word. And since we have a lot of words and I don't want to be saying them over and over again, let's call this tenacious context or tenacious C. So <laughs> now that we have our tenacious context, it begs the question, why do we need this tenacious context? So here I'd like to take you into my personal journey. Uh, as I said, I work at monday.com and I work on the autopilot team. We help users to automate their workflows. So we have users that have boards and manage all their data there. And we have these recipes. They're templates that when you do something that you do manually, you might be doing three more things right after. So we want to be able to come and automate that for you so that maybe when you change your status to done, the next three things that you would have done manually will happen behind the scenes. We do that with Monday actions that then trigger other Monday actions. And we also integrate with various third-party apps. So we have integrations with various companies and we might also let our users set these templates and automate things so that maybe when they receive an email from Gmail from a specific user, something in Monday would happen or the other way around. We're a microservice and we get a lot of requests <laughs> and some of those are from Monday, some of them from other parties. But when we were building the microservice, I guess it's, it's not so new anymore, we've been around for about a year then we wanted to add multi-tenant protection. So most apps today are multi-tenant. Uh, at Monday, a tenant is an account. A tenant where you work could be a specific user or a company. But in general, it's just something that can't have access to the information of another tenant. So we wanted to make sure that when we get an request from some account, maybe some event has happened and I need to trigger this automation, I want to know that I have access to the account ID that I get from that request, regardless of where I am in my flow, so that any I.O. operation I do, let's say I'm writing or reading from the database, I want to have that account ID in hand. So my first thought, being relatively new to Node at the time, was great, we can do this as some global variable. So let's talk about why that's not trivial in Node. I think this is probably the first time you guys are seeing anything that looks like this as no developers. No, I'm sure we've all seen a drawing similar to this in the past. So at the end of the day, let's imagine that we get different requests. We get requests from a user, uh, Annie, that's an account ID 42, and a user, Ben, that's an account ID 1138. So we might want to get these requests and handle them. And what we want is that wherever we're handling a specific request, we can access that specific account ID. So because of Node's nature being non-blocking, every time we have some async operation, we're going to register it and we're going to keep handling another request. So if we're taking a look at doing this with global variables, 
then the first thing we could do is maybe use some, let's skip ahead, maybe use some uh, middleware or do it in our controller. And what we want to do is when we first get the request, we want to extract the data that we want from that request and immediately use our execution service to put it somewhere. So in this example, my service would just be putting it in a global variable. Imagine that later on in my flow, I want to actually create that event. In my code that creates that event, I have some condition. And if my user meets that condition, then there's some async operation. After that, I just get that context from my service, and I can create an event. So let's look at this example. So imagine that we got the request from Annie, and we've come in, and our controller has indeed taken that account ID and the permissions of this user and put it on our global scope. So that's now accessible from wherever we want in the code, and we have that saved. We then get to the code that wants to create the event. Now, Annie does meet some condition, and so we're going to perform some async operation. In the meantime, we can handle another request. So we now get a request from Ben. When handling Ben's request, we update our global variable, and we now have a new account ID and new permissions. Before, we had an empty object for permissions because Annie didn't have any permissions, but Ben has master permissions. So we've now updated our global scope. We finish handling Ben's request. He doesn't meet some condition, and so we can create the event, and that was fine. But now we're back to handling Annie's request. When we handle Annie's request, we go to our execution service and we get this data, but at the end of the day, we're getting the wrong data because we've used our global scope, and we've, when we were handling Ben's request, we overwrote what we needed. So now that we've reminded ourselves why it's not just very trivial, we looked at the, what we could do with it if we wanted to do multi-tenant protection, but it actually does have a lot of pretty cool applications. It could be used for logical isolation, as we saw. It could also be used for request-level caching. You could mix it with the performance API and do profiling or performance monitoring. You could use it to enrich your stack. So I hope that one of these seems interesting to you or seems like it could be something interesting. Or maybe you have another idea of something that you could use it for. And if you do, then I'd be happy to hear about it after the lecture. You can come find me. Let's talk about how. So I think a lot of us do use async hooks maybe behind the scenes without, without knowing it. If you use libraries like continuation local storage or CLS hooked, which have more than a million weekly downloads together, they actually use async hooks. But async hooks is actually really easy to use and very straightforward. And I want to show you how you can kind of use it and create something very fast and very dependable and use it on your own. So if we go back to my personal journey, we agreed that global variables are not really a solution. Another thing we could do is string it along as an argument to all our functions. Right? The minute I get it in my request, I could extract it. And then every time I call a function, specifically every time I await something, I would hand it on as a parameter, and it would then be inside the local scope of that function. It would work. You would indeed have that inside the local scope of the function, but it's very hard to maintain. You know, I've, imagine seeing a function, and you see that account ID is passed in this an argument, even though the function doesn't use account ID for anything. It just calls a function with that, and that could happen six, seven times until you finally end up using it. I know I wouldn't want to maintain code like that, especially in an area where we really can't afford errors. So then someone, uh, one of our team leads at Monday, suggested I look into async hooks. So here, the first thing I did after opening the documentation was watch a YouTube lecture by Sebastian Kurland. I also had uh, the opportunity to have a quick uh, Zoom chat with him, which was even more helpful. So for any of you looking to look into this a bit more, it really is a great lecture. And a quick sh shout out to Sebastian. Thank you. Whoop. But let's go back to async hooks and what they are. So async hooks is a node module, and it allows us to trap different events inside the cycle of an async resource, inside the lifetime. So it gives us an API where we can 
we can implement callbacks and kind of inject our own code into these different events happening in the lifecycle of an async resource. So the next question is, what is an async resource? So an async resource is anything that inherits from async wrap. It's anything that can have an associated callback. There are lots of types of async resources. Here you can just see all the resources that are listed on the async hooks documentation. I'm sure every one of you can spot your favorite resource, right? We all have our, our favorite type of resource. Uh, mine is a uh, random bytes request because uh, it always takes me by surprise. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, <laughs> what might be a little more uh, well-known, you know, maybe sounds more familiar, timeout or promise, most of us just end up using the syntactic sugar of async await. But what actually happens behind the scenes is every time there is some resource that has an associated callback, there is an object constructed. The object constructed is some async resource that has a potential callback. This doesn't mean the callback will definitely be registered. Think of a server that you might start listening for requests. You could potentially close that server, stop listening before any requests arrived. So the callback could be called zero times, but it could be called multiple times. Once uh, we do register that callback, that callback is eventually executed, and it eventually finishes executing, hopefully. And once we're done with that async resource, then it is destroyed, either by calling emit destroy explicitly or by uh, the garbage collector. So async hooks allows us to implement uh, these callbacks. We'll be focusing today on init and destroy, but just a quick go over, init is really when that resource is initialized, and, and then before and after are called right before the callback is called and after it uh, has finished executing. Destroy, as we said, is when the resource is destroyed, and promise resolve is specifically for promises. This is treated a bit differently because the way promises are implemented with generators, but today we'll really be focusing on init and destroy. So if we go back to our example, when we got that request, what we want is to be able to save our context object in a way that we'll be able to access it regardless where we are and know that it pertains to the specific request we're handling. So imagine that we use a map. We want to have a map that has some specific unique ID that is related to the specific async resource we're currently in. So let's imagine that when we got the request, we already set this up, and now we have on our map a unique ID 13, and we have some context object. When we create another async resource, so when we have that async operation happening in this flow, we want to add another entry, and we want to have another unique ID. We have 201 created, and this context object is that same context object from 13, so we're still in the context of the same request. We can then handle Ben's request, that's a whole separate thing, but when we get back to handling Annie's request, then we know that we have a way to, hand, to uh, go and get this context that we set up with this unique ID. So let's look at how we did that. So the first thing we want to do is require async hooks. We want to create our map, uh, the one that we just saw, and we want to create an instance of async hooks. We do this by calling create hooks. We do this by calling create hooks, sorry, and passing the callbacks that we implement into it. So here we've chosen to implement init and destroy. We'll take a look at them in a second. And that last thing we do is just enable it. This enable just means that we're now listening, and all these callbacks are actually going to be injected into these lifecycle events. So let's look at how we implement init. So if we said we already have some, um, an entry in our map that has some ID with a context. We'll take a look at when we created that later. What we have is a map that is, that's the keys of which are the async IDs of our resources. So let's imagine that we already have this async resource with async ID 13. Async hooks gives a unique ID to every async resource created, so this is very handy. So inside our init, what we get is async ID, type, and trigger async ID. Async ID is that unique ID of the resource. Type is that resource type. And trigger async ID 
is the async ID of the resource that was in charge of creating me. So the trigger async ID is kind of why I was created or who created me. It's kind of a direct uh, parent. So the first thing we do is we really get that parent context from the map. If we have parent context in the map, we can just get it using the trigger async ID because any async resource that came before will already have been entered when it was created, when it was initialized. If we don't have parent context, then we immediately want to return. In general, it's important to remember anything you write in these callbacks will be run all of the time. Uh, I know that I was surprised to find out how many async resources are kind of uh, being created and destroyed behind the scenes that I didn't really realize. This really happens uh, a lot, and so we need to be very minded to memory and to performance and do only exactly what's necessary. So if we don't have that parent context, we return. If we do, then very straightforward. All we do is we set an entry in our map with the current async ID with that parent context. So now that we know that, regardless of when we run this code, we're going to have access to this context. Now you can notice here that we've given a uh, reference to the object and not uh, deconstructed and given a uh, duplicate. Again, we just want to be very minded. Uh, this also helps us because since it's a reference, the minute that these entries are cleaned up, the garbage collector will just clean up the object and we don't have to worry about when to destroy it. So when we get a new async resource, let's imagine that async uh, resource with ID 201 was created. Its trigger async ID will indeed be 13 and we have a new entry in our map. Next, we want to look at destroy. So destroy happens when this async resource uh, is cleaned up. And again, very, very straightforward. The only thing we do is we use our async ID. We don't have to worry about passing this along. Async hooks takes care of all of this for us. And we just delete it from the map. Something interesting that I tried when I was starting out is uh, I really found out that there was a lot going on behind the scenes that I wasn't really aware of. So I thought, OK, I want to add some console logs and see when resources are created and when they're destroyed. If it happens in direct correlation, how far apart, things like that. So I added a kind of console log with an async ID and some timestamp into init and into destroy. And I ran it, and I was like, this is going to be interesting. And I immediately got a call stack size exceeded which is everyone's favorite thing to see, because console logs are also async operations. So when you're writing your code into these callbacks, it's also important to be very minded to what's synchronous and what is not, because anything asynchronous that you put inside these callbacks will create an endless loop. So we saw how we implemented our init and destroy. Uh, let's remember that what we did is we created an instance and we just passed into create hook our init and destroy that we implemented. We now don't have to worry about calling them. They will be called automatically or hooked and our code will run anytime these events happen. So let's look at how we created this context in the first place. So we want to have a service that we can access anywhere in our code that will create an execution context. Now, because async hooks is going to do all the hard work for us, the only other function we need is get. So when we implement our service, we really only have to worry about these two functions. So for create execution context, what we want to do is get an async ID of where we're at right now. So you can see that we use async hooks, and we call execution async ID. If trigger async ID was more of a who's in charge of creating me, execution async ID is more of a temporal identifier kind of when we are right now. And this async ID will help me to create that context so that anyone in the function flow after me that it pertains to my specific request will have this context. So what we do, we get that async ID, and we just set an entry in the map with our context. The next function we have to worry about is get. Our get execution context, once again, we get async ID the same way, and then we can just get it from the map and return that. So let's look at how we would use that in the example we spoke of earlier. So inside our controller or our middleware, the first place where we get the request, we can extract 
the information that we want, and then we just call this create execution context. We now know that it's set safely into our map, and that regardless of where we are later, each request when being handled will be able to access that specific information, and we can depend on the fact that it'll be pertaining to this specific request. And then, as we've said, we can use it wherever we want in the flow. So maybe when I'm creating my events, then I'll just get my execution context and use that. And now I really don't have to worry about the fact that I might have handled you know, 47 other requests in the meantime, and I don't have to worry that anything was overridden, because each time it was just a new entry in the map with that specific async ID. Even if we had a lot of different async operations along the way, that wouldn't bother us because along that chain, every time an async resource is initialized, it would just get the reference to the context object that I originally extracted from that request. So this is definitely a lot better and a lot, uh, we're in a much better place than we were with our global variables. The next thing I want to mention is that this is really something that you can do very easily on your own. Uh, we do have all the code snippets that you saw today are from uh, shiny new open source, so you can go and use this. It does have a bit more uh, error handling, a bit more validations, but it really is very lean. And what you saw today is the core of what's implemented there. So there really isn't, um, isn't any complication. And uh, you're very welcome to use it. Other libraries uh, that are open source uh, and can create this tenacious context for you as well are up there. Uh, and I did finish a bit early, but uh, that's my time. And once again, I'm a full stack developer at monday.com, so you can find me at the Monday stand if anyone has any questions later. And thank you so much. Thank you.